So I've noticed this ongoing trend as of late, and help me understand if you have captured this as well. When I grew up, back in my day, there was this rule that Christmas Day Court did not come out until the day after Thanksgiving. But have you noticed how Christmas continues to encroach more and more into November? Well, a couple of years ago, I noticed maybe a week prior to Thanksgiving, you would see Christmas lights or maybe some festivities. But I'm telling you, November 1st hit this year, and it was like Christmas threw up in my neighborhood. <laughs> Christmas was everywhere, even so much so that I and my wife were thinking to myself, do we begin November 1st now? It is a lot of work lugging out those tubs from the garage or whatever dark cavern you've hid in those trees within. But you pull it out and November 1st comes and light's coming, but there is still one final piece of Christmas that does not come out until the day after Thanksgiving. It can't. It's called your Christmas tree. Christmas tree does not make, thank you, Pastor Damien, does not make an early entrance. But I've learned that there's two types of people. There are those that have a real Christmas tree and those that have a fake Christmas tree. This has been a debate for quite some time. Now, I will not call it fake because it sounds so harsh. We'll call it artificial today. <laughs> so we have the real Christmas tree people and the artificial tree people. Now, I grew up in an artificial tree household. How many with me there? No Christmas jeers in this moment. We had allergies in my house. So we were unable to have a Christmas tree. We didn't want an anaphylactic shock on Christmas Day. So, that being said, we had a fake tree all my life, and we enjoyed it. But then things changed when I got married. That first Christmas, my wife then says, let's go to the Christmas tree. I said, great, let's go to Target. <laughs> she says, what Christmas trees are at Target? I said, the real good fake Christmas trees. I said, not in my house. I said, absolutely in this house. And we began to debate, so I convinced her of the economics of it. So why would we get something that withers in 24 days when we can have something that can maybe outlast our own lives, even our marriage here? This tree would stand in our house and, and withstand the fire. It's fire-retardant trees. These are, these are great trees. And we got this fake artificial tree and put it in our house, and it was pretty underwhelming for about 10 years. And then my wife... And my kids ganged up on me one day. They cornered me and they said, not again, Father. We are getting a real Christmas tree this year. And I tried to convince them, but there's no economic talk with a three-year-old. So they said, Dad, this is what we're supposed to do. So I said, okay, if we're getting a Christmas tree that's real, we ain't getting no Charlie Brown Christmas tree. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You ever see these pictures like this? Ain't no Charlie Brown Christmas tree in my house. So we're going to go and cut this tree down. So my wife found a place to go cut this down. In Georgetown, there's a Christmas tree farm. So we go on the hunt. It's like the spoils of war. You are hunting for your Christmas tree. And there's all these trees that are rejected by my family until we find that one. And we find that Christmas tree. And there I am with the saw in which my wife removes it from my hand and says, no, this is my tree. And she begins to saw this tree down. <laughs> Her desire will be to rule over her husband. <laughs> Genesis 3 says. <laughs> so we get this Christmas tree. And we start to carry My wife actually carried it. I found out. She reminded me this morning. I carried the tree then. So we carry the tree down. There it is. We carry the tree down. And, and of course, you want the approval of the tree ranger that's there. It's a good looking Christmas tree. I'm like, yes. We got the professional thumbs up from the Christmas tree ranger. So we are there. My friend Isaiah is there. He got his tree as well. And I throw it on top of my car. I never tied a Christmas tree on a car before. I was new to this. But I bought these special straps from Ace Hardware and I put it on. And then the guy comes over and says, No, 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 let me do it. I'm a professional. I said, Okay, professional. So he ties up our trees. He says, You're all good. I'm like, There's security. He's like, Absolutely. I do this every day. I start to drive down the highway and I hear this rattling. 
He starts to rattle and then he starts to shake. And I realize the trees are becoming loose on top of my car, but before I can pull over, the trees fly off. And I'm like, the, the, everything flashes before your eyes. Like, people are dead. You know, like that's what you think. Like there's gonna be some child like impaled with this tree. Is what you think in your mind. But I pull over and, and by God's grace, no one was on the road. No cars were there. We pull them over. My friend Isaiah gets them and we put them up and I put the Christmas trees on top of the car. Thank you very much. And as we were there, then the day came and you put the Christmas tree inside the house. And it's there, the smell fills the house, and then the question is asked, who will put the star on the tree? And yes, the dad will put the star on the tree. And as we're there, then the moment comes where it's pitch black and light comes into the house. And it's a magical moment in which everyone rejoices. Here's a picture of our tree this year. Now, we will never have a tree like this in our house again. It's a gorgeous tree. It's a beautiful tree. It smells amazing. But this year at the Christmas tree farm, again, they say you could cut down any tree you would like to take home with you. But as we cut it down, we found this tree that looked incredible. But as I touched it, it was spiky and it was sappy. and It was really, really difficult to hold. My whole arm reacts to it. My friend Alex's arm reacts to it. We get it to the tree ranger. He's like, ooh, good looking tree. It's like you cut down one of our sequoias. By <laughs> God's grace, it was not the most expensive Christmas tree I've ever bought in my life, but it could have been. He says, don't worry, I'll throw it on top of the car for you. I said, no, I'll do it this time. Thank you so much. So we will never have a Christmas tree like this in our house yet again. But the Christmas tree story is really a unique tradition. When you look at the history of these stories, if you want some free entertainment, look up the origins of Christmas. You'll find some funny things mm -hmm. online. But as you notice here, that the evergreens and, and different festivities have been around for thousands of years, right around the winter time. The Christmas tree is quite unique. They believe it started in Germany. And they would cut down these fir trees, these evergreens. They would put them in the center of their house to remind them that spring would eventually come after the winter. How many are grateful to live in California, my friends? <laughs> Please let winter end. That's what they're doing every night as they look at these evergreen trees. So one pastor one evening is walking down the road, and he notices the stars glistening off the snow on one of the evergreen trees in the forest. And he gets this idea. He then goes back home. He grabs all of his wife's candles, and he places them throughout this evergreen. Not the most fire-safe individual. But as he puts them throughout the tree, he invites over his family and all of his neighbors. And as they stand before the tree, he reads this verse from Matthew chapter 4. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. And as he stood there, he began to preach the gospel. That man's name was Martin Luther. And from that time forward, we've put lights on trees by God's grace. It's not literal fire any longer. But there's this amazing symbolism that we have here of light and this star. But what Matthew was doing in chapter 4 was he was not just giving some social media status update of Jesus' arrival. He was answering the question that had plagued the people of Israel for nearly 700 years. Who was this one that would bring light in the midst of their darkness. Yeah. See, he quotes this passage from Isaiah chapter 9. Now, Isaiah was this wild prophet. Often when you think of prophets, you think of these very stoic individuals that may speak on occasion. Isaiah was incredibly loud. Isaiah was incredibly aggressive. He was willing to do anything that God said. Even so, in Isaiah 20, it said that God spoke to him to walk around naked for three years, in which he did so. Isaiah lived a radical life. I don't believe that's the word of the Lord for any of you this morning. <laughs> but Isaiah would speak on the Lord's behalf to no matter who was in charge. And at this time in Israel's kingdom, there is this Assyrian kingdom that has oppressed them and literally has begun to take many of those that they're at war with captive. And they would put them in these yoke of oxen, and they would carry them. Here's actually a picture of what one of the yoke would look like. Do we have that picture? It's a few slides ahead. They would wrap them in this. Now, again, this was a cattle oxen, but this is often how it would look. Here's the artist's rendition of that time frame. They would parade them 
without clothes on. They would whip them, and they would take them away from their families. This is what they were experiencing at that time. They believed that they were steeped in darkness. In the midst of this confusion, Isaiah stands before the king and the people of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, he declares this. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the nations. You see, when Matthew lines this up, it's quite significant. The area of the Sea of Galilee was really the most tensious place. This is like the Gaza Strip. There was no chance that this would ever be a place of peace. This was the most oppressed place that anywhere of Israel. But he says one day light will dawn in this place. It just so happens that Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee performing miracles in which Matthew places this verse. Yeah. So they say, how could this be? This is the darkest place. He says, in that place, there will be no anguish. It's a beautiful word that they use in Hebrew. It literally means where the river begins to narrow, where the water begins to run dry. He says, for those of you in anguish and anxiety, for those of you it feels like the life source is taken from you, behold, one is coming who will bring you life yet again. One is coming that will broaden that place of dry and weariness. He will come to refresh your souls. On top of that, he will bring you light. Verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. He uses this word, deep darkness. There was this phrase they would use in Israel called the shadow of death. It was this time in your life where it seemed like everything was taken away from you. Maybe someone had betrayed you. David writes beautifully about it in Psalm 23 that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow, I will fear no evil. But what happens when an entire people are underneath that shadow? The nation had lost its hope. You see, when a friend is going through that shadow, you can help them. But what happens when there's no one else there to help? As they're yoked under oppression, he says, behold, light will come your way. It will shine in your path yet again. Because remember, my friends, he is the good shepherd. Yeah, right. yeah. In verse 4, he then goes on to say this. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as you did on the day of Midian. Yeah. He says, behold, God's going to come your way. He's going to break the yoke just like he did for Gideon. Now, if you guys remember the story of Gideon, it is a pathetic and sad hero story. We have this man in a wine press threshing wheat. He's so afraid of the Midianites. He's there. And this angel of the Lord comes and says, mighty man of valor. Yes, yes, I've called yes, you to great things. Yes. Isn't that how God sees yes. us in their moments? Yes. We were pathetic and weak. And he says, hey, you, I pick you. Amen. How many of you have ever been overlooked on a sports team before? You know, there was always that kid. Maybe you were that kid. It would always get picked last. Oh, yeah. Jesus says, I want that one first. Yeah. Yeah. So he picks Gideon, and he leads them with 20,000. He says, too many. Right. He whittles the army down. 10,000, too many. He has 300 peasants working with him. He says, that's the army I choose. And what's unique about the story of Gideon, it's not a battle in which they actually fought themselves. Mm, right. They surround the camp, Amen. and they overhear the rumor of a dream. Yeah. Yeah. And this Midianite says, behold, I had a dream of a loaf of bread rolling like a rock into our tent. And behold, I believe it's the armies of Israel. Wow. Yes. Isn't it like the Lord that uses the obscure yes. and the odd things to confound the wise? And Gideon says, that's the word of the Lord. Blows his trumpet and they overcome. He says, like in that day, it will come and it will break the rod of the oppressor. Verse 6, Ryan quoted earlier, but let's just enlighten it a little bit. For a child has been born for us, a son to give us authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. So when you hear this prophecy, you're thinking to yourselves, God's going to come like he did in the days of Egypt. And when you hear Isaiah say, I'm going to give you a child, yeah. you're thinking to yourself, what good will that do? Yeah. How many parents know children are not the ones that are going to save the day? 
<laughs> but you hear this. What, what could this child actually do? And, and, he, and he puts a spin on verse 4. He says, behold, authority will be upon his shoulders. He literally mirrors the yoke of oppression on their shoulders by Midian. And what he says is just like Assyria and Midian put an oppression upon you, he's going to take the yoke upon himself and break it. You catching that symbolism there? He's literally going to take the yoke of your oppressor because authority is on his shoulders. It literally means the word domination. Yeah. And he's going to dominate the oppression of the enemy. How many know there was one named Jesus who took his cross upon his shoulders? The cross we were intended to carry, and he broke the power of sin and death. That's the picture here. But they did not understand that at the time. He then goes on to give him more names. He calls him Wonderful Counselor. Now, if you grew up in the 80s and 90s of Christianity, you knew the Amy Grant song. Wonderful Counselor. No, 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 no. You know, we are the Emmanuel song. But we become so accustomed that, that we lose the potency of the language that Isaiah is using. We just become names and titles and songs that we sing. We domesticate the titles of God. But what he says here is so profound. He says he's going to be the wonderful counselor. It literally means the miraculous miracle worker. He's the one that brings the miracles, and he's the counselor. But it's not like a counselor you go to and says, tell me your problems. Where do we begin? It literally says, the one that knows the answer when no one else does. A miraculous counselor is coming your way. On top of that, he's called the mighty God. He's the one that is the hero and champion. It's the same phrase they use to describe Goliath. That he's the one that is your champion, your hero, but he's going to be the God of all other gods. This is not some normal child. He goes on to say he's the everlasting father. It's a beautiful phrase. It literally means the forever father, that which time cannot outlast. Yeah. He's the one that doesn't expire. You ever buy food with an expiration date? And it does not reach that date. It's the worst day. I cleaned up my fridge yesterday. There's some funky things in that fridge. <laughs> You could buy these meals and you put it in and the next day you're like, what's that smell? You see, that time creates decay upon those things that are costly. But there's a forever father coming that time cannot outlast. Yeah, yeah. One that overcomes decay. Yes. One that will renew and restore. And lastly, he will be known as the Prince of Peace. And Out of all these titles, it seems like the one that's probably the most placid. But it literally means the commander of the army yeah. that will bring success, prosperity, and the shalom of God. Yes, yes, yes. He's the one to end all wars. Yeah. This is the one. Now, what's unique about this whole succession of names is it was a tradition in the Egyptian culture to give their new pharaoh throne names. Here's what one scholar Writes, he says this, it was customary to give five throne names to an Egyptian king upon his coronation. These were related to the various gods and were understood to have magical effect. Such names as mighty bull, enduring kingship, god of heaven were typical. So what he does here is Isaiah says, this is a king that is greater than any god or pharaoh of Egypt. He literally brings in every language of oppression that they would know of Midian and Egypt and now Assyria. Say, this one that is coming is greater than any king that's gone before him. This is the almighty God. This is what you're encountering here. Now, shortly afterwards, they're awaiting this king. Soon born to them is this young boy named Hezekiah. And Hezekiah has now been given these prophecies and the expectation of their fulfillment is upon him. Well, he does all the right things. He goes into the temple. He learns the scriptures. He starts to do all the stuff a good king would do. He begins to end the oppression of Assyria, but there's a problem. He starts to partner with another nation called Babylon. And as he partners with Babylon and they use him as an ally, he starts to put his trust in his own strength. How many know that we put our trust often in things that will not last? Yeah. Come on. 
And as he builds this relationship, this connection with Babylon, they hear that Hezekiah is ill. And they send over different leaders to give him a gift because they're an important ally. But as he's there, it says that Hezekiah showed them everything. He opened up the treasury of the storehouse of the temple. He showed them everything. And Isaiah gets word of this. And he walks over to him in Isaiah chapter 39. He says, what exactly did you show them? He says, I showed them everything. I literally held nothing from them. And upon this, it reveals the heart of Hezekiah. He literally trusted in the nations, it says. He trusted in Babylon more than he trusted God. It was this revealing, this moment where it was like Hezekiah opened up his heart and what was inside were the treasures that he acquired. The wealth he had won. But how many know that Jesus warns us where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And it shows that his trust is in the treasures that he's acquired. It literally says that he rejoiced over Babylon. It means he praised them. It's like he worshipped them. He longed for the approval of the popular kid at school. He longed and lusted for the success of other nations. And in this moment, Isaiah knows the judgments come to Israel. This was their last shot. Would they trust the Lord? And Isaiah says, I'm sorry to tell you, Hezekiah, but your children and their children will be taken away by the nation you've given your heart to. All that you've shown them will be taken by Babylon. Now, a chilling thing happens here in Hezekiah 30, or Isaiah 39. Hezekiah says this. He says, the word of the Lord is good. Now, it, it means that he affirms it, that he believes that God has spoken it, like other kings would reject it. But what's terrifying is this. He literally says, for in his heart he thought, at least there will be success and safety in my days. What Hezekiah reveals is that he's glad that the pain won't come his way. Yeah. But oh well, if it happens to my children. Mercy. Mercy. It reveals that this prophecy of Isaiah 9 is not his. And scholars say it was in that moment it showed that he was not that child. Shortly afterwards, Babylon comes and rips the nation apart. Hezekiah's children are taken and his relatives are taken. One of those relatives that are held captive is a young boy named Daniel. And as Daniel's in this kingdom with this king called Nebuchadnezzar, they recognize that Daniel and his three friends have some special gifts. Well, he had this court of magicians, these wise men, they called them. Well, one day he gets this dream and he says, I need you to interpret it. If you don't, I'll kill you. Well, how many knows that's a put you on the spot moment with God? Well, he says, okay, we'll pray. God gives Daniel the dream. He interprets it. Nebuchadnezzar is so overwhelmed by it, he promotes Daniel to be the chief of all of his wise men. He's a chief administrator. And so what Daniel does is he begins to train them into the word of the Lord and the ways of Israel. And as he trains them, as he teaches them, another nation called Persia comes in and overtakes the kingdom of Babylon. Well, as the Persians come in, they recognize Daniel's gift. In his old age, he continues this school. And as he teaches them, these wise men, it's translated magi. As he trains these magi, these magicians, he tells them to look for the promises of the king of Israel. Yeah. And he says, there's going to be a significant promise your way, and I want to train you in one particular promise. It's an obscure promise. It's found in Numbers chapter 24. It's actually by a prophet that was against Israel. His name was Balaam. But Balaam said this, and we believe the word is true. This is what Balaam said in Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near for behold, there will be a star that shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. One out of Jacob shall rule. 
He trained this group of magicians, of magi, to look for a star. And when they saw that star, there would be a king that would follow. To continue our story, would you welcome my friend Damien Chandler. this morning, and as I told them in the first service, uh, anything that's deep and anything that's good, you've heard it already. You've already received the meat of the message, and now my, it's my job to bring the gravy. Is that okay? Yeah. But remember, the gravy makes the meat taste good. Yeah? I want us to put our, our hands together for our pastor, Pastor Brandon Naramore. Okay. Amen. Well, I love to travel, and a few years ago, I traveled to Spain, Barcelona. Had a blast. Loved it so much that I had to go back again, but this time I went back with some friends, pastor friends of mine. And I noticed something about us, what I noticed is that we were late to everything. If we said that we needed to get there at 7, we showed up at 8.30, 9 o'clock, wondering why the, why the party was over. We were just late to everything. Well, it was our time to return, and I was determined not to be late. So I got up, we got the house clean, the uh, Airbnb, we turned in the keys, and I told these guys, it's time to go, we need to get on the plane. These two brothers decided that they had to buy some gifts for their friends, for their family, for their kids. And I said, we don't have time to buy gifts, we need to go get on the plane. They stopped and bought gifts anyway. And when we got to the train station, I watched the train that we were supposed to take to the airport disappearing in the distance. I was hot. I was mad. We got on the next train, and the next train stalled about 10 minutes into the journey. I was very hot. I was very mad. And I didn't want to have any conversations with anyone. And in the back of my mind and in the front of my heart, I was cussing some veggie cuss words because there was something very wrong with this. We get to the airport, and when we get to the airport, I come running to the, to the desk, and the lady at the desk says to me, your plane left 10 minutes ago. Oh, Jesus. I was so mad that I decided on that day that these boys are no longer my friends. I am going to slash their tires. It was a bad day. We were stuck in Barcelona, and I had no idea how we were going to get home. I begged. I put on my Charlie Brown face. I went up to the counter again. And when I went up to the counter, the lady told me that the ticket home was $2,200. I called every number that I knew. I called everyone that I could call. I called, uh, I called the help desk. I called everything, and in the end, they found me a way home. But the way that I would have to take is that I would have to take a plane from Barcelona to Milan. I would have to sleep in the airport and get up the next day and take a plane from Milan to some other city. And then I'd have to stay there for eight hours. And then I would have to take another plane ride home and I would finally get to uh, Sacramento. I would get to Sacramento over 24 hours later. For me, it didn't matter, though, because while I was in the airport in Spain, all I could think about is fighting to get home to my family. All I could think about is wanting to get home to my kids. All I could think about was wanting to find my wife. I was fighting to get home. The Bible tells us about three men who were fighting to get to a place. These men are called the three wise men, the three magi. And according to Pastor Brandon, they were coming from the area of Babylon or the area of Persia. Oftentimes, we've sung about them. We have written poems about them. Uh, we have things on our front lawn that, that represent them. But we really don't know what these men went through in order to get to Jesus. So can I tell you really quick what they went through in order to get to Jesus? These three men had to cross probably two to three rivers in order to get to Jesus. 
They had to climb two mountain ranges in order to get to Jesus. In fact, the city of Bethlehem is 2,500 feet above sea level, which means that at the end of their journey, they had to climb up a mountain in order to get to Jesus. They had to skirt the desert of Arabia in order to get to Jesus. And all of this, riding a donkey 1,000 miles, which would have taken them three months in order to get to Jesus. Is there anybody in the building that in 2018 had to fight to get to Jesus? You had to fight to get to your king, but there was something about you that kept you moving, that kept your legs moving, that kept your brain working, because you had to get to the king. I don't know if I'm in the wrong place, but is there anybody in the building that fights to get to the king? These men had to fight to get to Jesus. When they finally arrived in Jerusalem, they arrive in Jerusalem in a town where people were supposed to be ready to receive the king. And after fighting and, and crossing rivers and crossing deserts, after climbing mountains, and after, after doing all of that to get to the king, they come to a city where the city is not re ready to receive the king. In Matthew 2 uh, and verse 3 it says, uh, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east, they came to Jerusalem, and they asked, where is the one to be born King of the Jews? This is what they said. They said, the king is here, and we have come to worship him. They said that the city is nice, but we're not here for the city. We came to worship the king. The palace is nice, but we're not here for the palace. We came to worship the king. Uh, the food might be nice, but we're not here for the food. We came to worship the king. If the Magi were at the Rock of Roseville, they would have said, hey, the, the parking lot is nice, but I didn't come for the parking lot. I came to worship the king. They would have said that the coffee was fantastic, but I didn't come for the coffee. I came to worship the king. The screens and the lights are great, but I came to worship the king. When you got a focused mind, when you only got one purpose, all the electricity in the building could come to a crashing halt. They could run out of coffee in the lobby. There could be no parking spaces in the parking lot, but when you got a fixed mind, when you got a one-track mind, you walk into this building and the only reason why I'm here is because I came to worship the king. I wonder if there's two, three people that are this Christmas you're going to tell that the reason why you're here is to worship the king. Climbed over mountains and crossed rivers and went around deserts in order to just worship the king. They said we went through too much not to worship him. They're focused on worshiping the king. But whenever you are determined to worship, you got to be prepared to be disturbed. They arrive at Jerusalem, this place that is supposed to be ready to receive the king, and there's this man called Herod. And the Bible says uh, in Matthew 2, verse 3, that when King Herod heard what these men had come to do and that another king was going to be born in Jerusalem, he was disturbed. Herod was disturbed. But why was Herod disturbed? Herod was disturbed because the birth of another king threatened his kingdom because it risked his rule. I hope you're listening this morning. I hope you're listening this morning. Because it meant that the city would no longer belong to him. The birth of the king disturbed Herod because a new king meant that the city would be under a new allegiance. The birth of a king disturbed him because it meant that the city was under different influence. It meant that he would lose his sway and he would lose his authority. If there was another king, it meant that Herod was no longer in charge. Listen to me very carefully because someone is going to receive deliverance in this moment. The moment that you set your mind on worship the king, the moment that you set your mind on climbing every mountain in your life and crossing every river and crawling through all the sewage of 2018 in order to get to the king, you disturb the enemy. And the reason why you disturb the enemy is because the enemy realized that if you ever get to the king, hallelujah, if you ever get to the king, then his reign over your life 
would come to an end. So what the enemy decides to do is what Herod does. He creates a disturbance, not only a disturbance, but he creates distraction because the enemy likes to have reign in your heart. He likes to have reign over your life. He likes the fact that your family is caught in generational curses. And he realizes that if you ever get to the manger where Jesus is, his reign in your life will be over. Someone in this building knows, he knows you've been walking what it's been like to be under bondage, what it's been like to be addicted. And the enemy has been trying to disturb you. He's been trying to distract you. But I want you to place your two feet firmly on the floor and let the enemy know that there's only one king in my life. There's only one ruler in my life. There's only one ruler in my life. And his name is Jesus Christ. And focus on getting to the king. Touch the person next to you and say, I gotta get to the king. I gotta get to the king. Listen, when you get to the king, everything changes. Pastor Brandon, I was just thinking about something just now when you were preaching. You were talking about Gideon, and it was just so, it was so powerful. I made a note because I know that my people are going to be blessed with that little word because what you shared, I don't think that people heard. <clears throat> Gideon was a man that was entrapped. He was a man that was in bondage. He was a man that had no gifts, no talents. God shows up, and he says, I want to choose you. The amazing thing about when God chooses people is when I used to play basketball a long time ago, and I was choosing a team, I would always choose the stars because I wanted to win. Now, truth to be told, the reason why I would choose the stars, Pastor Brandon, is because I wasn't good enough at basketball to win all by myself. Someone would say, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. So when you're not good enough, you end up having to choose stars in order to win the game. But I've learned a lot about, about basketball through LeBron James. Because the way that LeBron James operates, he says, I'll go to Miami and I'll win with whoever you got there. I'll go to Cleveland and win with no-name people there. Why? Because I'm good enough. I don't need stars on my team to win the championship. Is there anyone in the building that knows that God is 10 times better, a million times better than LeBron James, and he says to every single believer in the house, Star. I don't need you to be successful because I don't need stars on my team to win a championship. Jesus. Yes. These men fight to get to the king. And the enemy knows, Herod knows that if they ever get to the king, his reign over that city is over. Ah. In this church, I've heard that we believe in a prophetic word. Amen? Amen. So touch the person's shoulder next to you and say, the reign of Herod in your life is over. There's a new king in town. There's a new king in town. There's a new king. There's a new king in town. Hallelujah. There's a new king. There's a new king. Ah, someone should be celebrating today because there's a new king. There's a new king in town. They said that we came too far. We went through too much. We crawl through too much. We live through too much. We seen too much. We experience too much not to get to the king. The Bible tells us why they came to worship the king. Uh, the Bible says that they came to Jerusalem and they came to worship. But then it continued and it says that their worship had a very peculiar definition that is, that is absolutely foreign from the modern church. The reason why we come to church to tell the truth is that we come to church because we enjoy each other. We come to church because we enjoy the music. If there was ever music that we didn't enjoy, we would probably find another church where the praise and worship team is a little bit more hype. Where the, the did you guys see the bass guy today? He was in it. He was like, guy on any praise team is always the bass guy. <laughs> always the bass guy. I used to think it was a drummer, but you know, you don't get to do all this in a drum cage. <laughs> but in the modern church, if the bass guy's not good enough, you change churches. Because we come to church not to give, but to receive. If you ever come to a church and prayers are not being answered, you leave. Why? Because you come to church to have your prayers answered. You come to church to be blessed. 
You come to church to see what you can receive. So the definition for worship for the modern church is getting or receiving. That's what you go to a church where you can get something out of it. You want Pastor Brandon to preach a sermon that you can get something out. But I would like to redefine worship based on these three magi that learned from Daniel. What they learned from Daniel is that worship is not about what I can receive. Worship is about what I can give. Ah, ha, ha. Wait, wait. Worship is about what I can give. Worship is not. What changes about how you worship if worship becomes what I can give? You know, when worship becomes what I can give, then I'll do what the Magi did. Do you know what they did? These three men, well, there were probably more than three. We don't know what the number is. But they actually thought about what they were going to give. The Bible says that they gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In other words, they gave gifts that were worthy of a king, gifts that were worthy of a god, a gift that spoke to this baby's purpose. They thought for three months about what they were going to give to the king. They, they, they concentrated, they, they studied, and they thought about what they would give to the king. I know that the praise and worship leader, I know that she feels great about the fact that we sing, but what would happen at the Rock Church if you spent all week long, six days and 23 hours, thinking about what you were going to give to the king? You put your worship in a bag, you, you tied it with a bow, and then when she played the first chord, before the first chord is played, this place would explode in worship because you spent all week long thinking about what you were going to give to the king. I want to give an instruction if you would allow me here at the Rock Roseville. I don't want you to wait for the praise team to hype you up. I don't want you to wait for the, the bass man to play your chord. I want you to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and walk into his courts with praise. Spend all week long thinking about the gift that you're going to give to the king. Are you with me this morning? These three wise men, these three wise men, they think about the gift that they have. Why? Because their definition of worship was not being blessed. Their definition of worship was to give their gift. It's not a mindless gift. They spent months and years preparing this gift for the king. They finally make it to the stable. They get past the distraction. They get past uh, uh, all the lack of preparedness in Jerusalem. And they finally get to the stable. Now, if I were these wise men, upon entering the stable, I would have held my chest up high. Why? Because I went through a lot just to get here and give this baby <laughs> this gift. But upon showing up, in the stable, they realize something. They realize that the entrance fee into the stable was that every single person in the stable gave something. The shepherds gave up their sheep. Joseph gave up his reputation. Mary gave up her body. You're not getting it. The entrance fee into the presence of God is that everyone that comes into the presence of God must give something. Can I take one more step? Oh, this is about to be good. Can I take one more step? The entrance fee into the presence of God is that everybody has to give something. But God never requires for everybody to give the same thing. So the shepherds could come because they gave their sheep. Joseph could come because he gave up his reputation. Uh, Mary could come because she gave up her body. The wise men could come because they gave their gifts. But God did not require for everybody to give the same thing. Let me break that down and make it relevant to, Ro to Roseville Rock Church. Listen to this. God is requiring everybody in this building to come in here with something to give to him. But he's not requiring for everybody to lift their hands. He's not requiring everyone to sing a song. He's not requiring everyone to say a prayer. He's not requiring everyone to know how to move people into worship. But he is requiring for every single person that enters this building, he says, you got to enter this building and give me something. I wonder if you came into the building and 
empty? I wonder if you came in the building and said you ain't got no gifts. Well, then if you are not married, then you could go ahead and be a shepherd. And if you're not a shepherd, you could go ahead and be Joseph. But every single person in this building needs to come into the presence of the king with some kind of gift. I wonder if there's anyone that will say by the waving of hands, I might not be able to sing. I might not be able to preach, but I'm going to come into the presence of God with a gift. Come with a gift. These men come in and all of a sudden they realize that everyone in the room has given a gift. So now I imagine what they do next is that they turn to the baby. And I imagine that their chests are high. And they're boasting. And they're talking about, do you know how far we've come? We walked 1,000 miles. It took us three months to get here. We climbed two mountain ranges. We went through two bodies of water. We went around the Arabian Desert. Do you know what it took for us to get here? Yes. Then I imagine, it's just, can you imagine with me? Can you imagine with me real quick? Oh, yeah. I imagine that prophetically, Jesus responds. And he says, do you know what it took for me to get here? <laughs> he said, Shepherd gave, shepherds gave sheep. I gave up my throne. Joseph gave his reputation, but I was despised and rejected by all men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And then Mary, Mary gave me her body for nine months. I gave my body for all of eternity. Do you know what it took for me to get here? And then he finally gets to the wise men. He says, and you gave me your gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I gave you the gift of eternal life. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus says to the wise men, coming into my presence, you better come into the presence of the king with a gift. But then he, re re then he responds to them and says, but don't you ever think that you could outgive me. Yeah. Right. There's a song that we sing in our church that says, You can't be God's giving, no matter how you try. Yeah? You can't be God's giving. Huh? I don't care how many songs you sung. I don't care how long you served. You cannot outbeat the king. Yeah, you can't outgive a king. No matter how hard you try. So when they realized that they couldn't outgive the king, and they realized that they had to bring a gift, but their gift could never, they could never outgift the king. I believe that these three wise men fall on their knees, and in an act of complete humility, they give the king their gifts. And then I believe, just this, this is just my imagination, my Maya, can you, can you imagine with me that they lay their gifts down and they say to the king, King, we brought you our gifts, but we realize that our gifts are not enough. What else can we give you? And I, I imagine just prophetically Jesus responds, my life for your life. Give me your life. I don't need your gold. Give me your life. I don't need your talents. Give me your life. I don't need your song. Give me your life. I want your life. So then we say, man, my life is messed up. I want your life. I'm not all that talented. I want your life. I want your life. I want all of you. I want all your brokenness. I want all of your I want all of your sickness. I want all of your disease. I want all of your curses. I want all of it. My life for your life. It's an exchange. I went to Chuck E. Cheese with my kids. Now, who in here don't like Chuck E? <laughs> now sometimes I go to Chuck E. Cheese with my kids because they want to go and then other times I go to Chuck E. Cheese with my kids because I want to go <laughs> so we go to Chuck E. Cheese and I'm, I'm playing with my son and we run out of tokens so I go get more tokens and then we run out of those tokens and I wasn't doing good I can never remember the name of the game you know what I mean just one action what is it? Skeet 
I'm really horrible at ski ball. You just, that's, so I'm not getting no tickets. And the whole purpose of going to Chuck E. Cheese get tickets so you can get prizes, right? So I go spend more money on tokens so I get tickets on ski ball. Just skibby, ski ball, yeah? So at the end of it, I spent all this money, we got all these tickets, I go up to the counter, and I know we're about to be balling. Cause you know, you, they got the big thing, the Nerf gun on the top, it's like 20,000 tickets. And I know I got enough tickets. I go in there, I count them up, and I got like 200 tickets. <laughs> and I asked the lady, I said, hey, hey, uh, so, you know, what am I gonna get with my 200 tickets? And she said, a Tootsie Roll, a lollipop, and some strange plastic thing from China. And I was like, what? Then I started to add it up, and I was like, wait a minute. I spent $45 on them tokens. And for my $45, I got a Tootsie Roll, a lollipop, and some strange thing from China? This isn't a, this isn't a fair exchange. It, it's not a fair exchange. I spent too much money to walk out of here with a Tootsie Roll. It's not a fair exchange. Your life for Jesus' life is not a fair exchange. And I don't care who you are. I don't care where you live. I don't care what you've done. Your life for Jesus' life is not a fair exchange. Your life for the King of Kings is not a fair exchange. You giving your life to Jesus when he gave his life literally for you will never be a fair exchange. But Jesus is not like Chuck E. Cheese. He's not like Chuck E. Cheese. Jesus says, I want you to come to me exactly the way you are. I want you to come into this stable exactly where you are. And I want you to give me your crap. And I'm going to give you my eternal life. I want you to give me your messed up life. And I'm going to give you a crown of righteousness. I want you to give me your messed up robe. And I'm going to give you a long white robe. I want you to give me your messed up history. And I will cut and copy my history onto your history. I want you to give me your messed up family. And I will adopt you into the world of family. It is not a fair exchange. Is there anybody in the building that will shout hallelujah because the exchange of your life is not a fair exchange. So with a God like that, what do I get to say when I am in the stable? All of a sudden my journey disappears. And my gifts fade. And I just sing, it's your breath in my lungs. So I pour out my praise. I pour out my praise. It's your breath in my lungs. So I pour out my praise. I pour out my praise. Great are you, Lord. Come on, come on, it's your breath. It's your breath in my lungs. So I pour out my praise. Pour out my praise. It's your breath in my lungs. So I pour out my praise. I pour out my praise. It's your breath in my lungs. So I pour out my praise. Pour out my praise. Great are you, Lord. And then I might say, to worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. When you're standing before a king, and you realize that all you have to offer is your worship. In your life, you just lift your hands and say, To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live. To worship you. Let's stop. Come on and say, To honor you, I live. To honor you, I live. To honor you, I live. Come 
go on and say, to honor you. To honor you, I live. To honor you, I live. I live to honor you. Because when you realize that no matter how far you've come, Jesus came further. No matter how much you give, Jesus gave more. You no longer walk into the stables with a chest held high. You walk into stables and you bow your heads. And you realize, I fought to get to the king. But the king fought to get to me. And he's so worthy. I wonder if there's anybody in the building right now, I believe that this is a holy moment, where someone in the building right now, you fought through 2018. You fought through it, you barely survived it. And right now, you're fighting into, the, that, into that stable, and you're laying your life before the Lord, and you realize that your life is not worthy, but you hear the voice of the king that says, no one who was ever born on this earth was worthy of my death. No one who was ever born on this earth is worthy of my presence, but I'll accept your crop, I'll accept your nastiness, I'll accept, I'll accept who you are. Bring it into the stable and lay it before me and watch the king of the kings and Lord of Lords with a championship losers like us. If you're in this building today as a praise and worship as a team plays I want you to press towards the throne of God and say God I don't have anything to offer you. I don't have anything to offer you. Nothing at all. Not my journey not my gifts but I'm so glad that you accept who I am in this stable. I'm so glad that I can bring a gift to a king. Is there anybody in the building today that wants to bring their gift to the king? If you're in here and you want to bring your gift to the king, could you, could you meet me at the altar as we bring our gifts to the king? Get out of your seats and, and come down to the altar with me. Join me at the altar. 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 Just say, God, it's been... It's been a horrible 2018. It's been whatever 2018 has been, I'm bringing it to the altar because you're worthy of it. You're worthy. You were worthy of the journey, oh God. You were worthy of the mountains, oh God. You were, you were worthy of me crawling, crawling through the sewage, oh God. You were worthy of me going through dry places and spaces in my life. I bring it to you. And so I say it's my breath. That's all I got left. Your breath in my lungs, so I'm going to pour out my praise. I'm going to, I'm going to give it to you. Anyone in the building still want to give it to God? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Press into the stable this morning. Join those who want to give their lives to the Lord again. Hallelujah. 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 Now we're in the stable, y'all. We're in the stable. We came to the stable not to get anything from the king. We came to give something to the king because he gave us his life. Hallelujah. 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 So I'm going to count to three. On the count of three, on the count of three, I want you to raise up a praise in this building. On the count of three, I want you to raise up a vocal praise, a loud praise, a hand clapping praise, a foot stomping praise. On the count of three, I want you to raise your voices and let the king know that you appreciate the fact that you're gonna, he's going to take your crappy life and he's going to give you his eternal life. Is there anybody in the building that's ready to raise a praise to our king? Is there anybody in the building that...